can go ahead and have a seat. So, so good. Man, thanks so much. Team, what a great time of worship this morning. Man, just to think in terms of our lives and what God does and how we get to come in and just focus on who he is and what he is doing. You know, this is, as Ryan said, this is our last uh, sermon on the series of Share Hope. We've been talking about this for several weeks, what it means for us as a church, uh, be able to tell other people the good news We've used the ping pong balls. I hope you have used those. I hope you have your name or someone's name, not necessarily your name, on someone's ping pong ball out there. The white one, of course, was someone that you know who is not a follower of Christ. We ask you to put that name on there to be praying for that. It's not too late to do that. You know, We're not going to take that down just today because the sermon series is over. Matter of fact, just because the sermon series is over doesn't mean we're going to stop talking about share and hope, right? I mean, man, that's what we do. That's who we are. And then, of course, the green ones that grow to be able to just kind of share the next step, what's going on in someone's life. And we've been doing that through teaching on three circles. You might recall that every week for the past few weeks, we've had a video about three circles and what that means. And then the blue ball is for someone who's made a decision to follow Christ. And so that's what our prayer is. That person moves from white to that, and you can celebrate that. That celebration is a big part of that. And today, as we kind of wrap up the series, a well, couple of things that we want to do is to celebrate, to talk about what it means to be able to continue sharing hope, and to really be able to say, hey, how do we be a part of that? Now, what we want to do this morning is a little bit, as we start here, I'm going to um, ask you to take that piece of paper. I hope you got a piece of paper. Did you come in this morning and hopefully someone gave you a piece of paper? Maybe not. Uh, did anybody not get a piece of paper? There are some people who are, who are looking like, well, I didn't get that. Well, anyway, if you didn't get that, it's a picture, as someone told me, of a polar bear, a polar bear with, mu uh, with a marshmallow and a snowstorm. That is not what this is, right? This is not that picture. This is a picture, this is a piece of paper for us to practice three circles. That's right. You've seen it on video. You've heard it from Pastor Nate. Now you get to practice it. How do you do it? Because it's one thing to watch it on a video. It's another thing to do it, right? It's another thing to say, how do I do this? So I, I need for you to get this out. If you don't have this, then write on your spouse's hand or somebody beside you. You know, just write somewhere. And you need a pen. Hope you have that. Because we got to do this. we got to practice this together. Because this really is about us, each of us, sharing what we believe to be the hope, the good news. And how do we do that? How do we make that practical so that you get to share that with someone else, right? So we call it three circles for a reason, right? The reason is it has three circles. And we're going to walk through these and you're going to draw it. So why don't you go ahead and put the first circle on your piece of paper, right? The very first circle. And that first circle is real important to us because in that first circle, we understand is God's design, right? God's design. Now, as you think about God's design, as you're thinking through these three circles, I just want to give you a little heads up because one of the questions that we've gotten asked several times, that I get asked a lot, really, when we talk about sharing our faith in Christ, is how do you get into a conversation with someone? How do you start the conversation about, hey, I want to talk about spiritual things? So one of the ways that I do that a lot of times is to talk about story. People love to tell their story, right? Their story means their life. And it's very easy to ask someone when you're in that conversation, hey, tell me, tell me your story. I mean, I, I use that word a lot. I say, tell me your story. Now, that could be that I know that person's story, and so for that person, I may not start that direction. But one of the ways that you can start is saying, hey, tell me your story. And most often, when someone tells you their story, they will say to you, well, what about you? And I respond by saying, well, you know, I do have a story, but my story really relates to the fact of who God is in my life. So let me share with you God's design and how God created us to be perfect, and God had a perfect life for us in that design, and God's design was for us to know him and to have the right relationship with him. I always start my story like that. Now, other occasions, you may not have an opportunity to ask a person's story, or you may already know the story, and so how do you get into that spiritual conversation? Well, one of the ways that I use to do that is to ask the question, hey, do you ever think about spiritual things? 
Because that's a, an easy lead-in question. You're talking to someone, you're having a serious conversation, maybe something's going on in their life and their family, and you want to talk to them about that. It's so easy to say, hey, do you, do you ever think about spiritual things? And most of the people say yes, some will say no, but either way, either way, whether they say yes or no, the response is, but you know, God has a great design. And God has a design for our lives, and God had a design for our family, and God had a design for your relationship to him. Easy transition. Now, maybe you met someone and you really don't know who they are, you've been around them a little bit. Another way to get into that conversation, I've given you two already, right? Ask them the story. The other question is, do you ever think about spiritual things? A third way that I often use is using a little acrostic. You know, a little cross again. It says, first of all, tell me about your family. It's the, it's the word fire, actually. F, tell me about your family. Let me know about who you are, your family, a little bit about you. And then also, then I ask that question, tell me what your interests are. I might not say, tell me your interests. I may say, what do you like to do? I like to go kayaking. I like to go out and play golf. I like to watch football or basketball. And so you begin to get to know that person. And then you can ask that question, well, what about the R? What about your religious background? Did you grow up going to church? Would you, had you ever done that kind of thing? And then for me, it's asking that fourth question, that E of fire, that would simply say, hey, if you had to stand before God and God said to you, why should I let you into heaven? How do you respond to God? Or do you know for certain that if you were to die today, you would go to heaven? One of those questions, exploratory questions, really helps us then to get into this conversation about God's design. God's design is for relationship. Now, now that's all just not part of what you're doing. When you're sharing three circles, you can take 90 seconds, you can take three minutes, you can take 10 minutes. It really depends on the amount of time you have to share the good news of the three circles. Now, the second circle, go ahead and draw that on your piece of paper, because the second circle is brokenness, right? It's brokenness. And brokenness, as we help people to understand that, is one of those things that we're dealing with because brokenness is what, what the relationship issue is. And so we begin to say, what causes brokenness? And the thing that causes brokenness is sin. What is sin? Sin is just departing from God. Sin is just moving from this, away from God's design for our lives in order to say we have brokenness in our life. Brokenness is what? You can draw the little arrows Brokenness can be shame. Brokenness can be guilt. Brokenness can be hurt in families. Brokenness can be a lot of things. And you and I both know that there's a lot of people who are walking through a lot of brokenness. There are a lot of things going on in their lives. So it's easy to say, you know, God has a great design, but because of sin, because of our departure from God's design, we find brokenness has occurred. We find brokenness in our lives. So but you know, sometimes brokenness can be helpful. Why can brokenness be helpful? Well, it leads to this third circle, right? Now, obviously here, I'm not very good at art, okay? You can tell that. I can't even draw a circle, but I don't have to be. It's not about how good it looks. It's not about all the exact words that you get. Don't ever think you have to go into a conversation with someone and say, oh, I've got all the exact words. We won't, and it doesn't matter because we're also relying upon the Holy Spirit, right? A good gospel presentation is just sharing the good news of Jesus and leaving the results to God, whatever the Holy Spirit's doing in that person's life. But when I talk about brokenness, I get to this third circle, which oftentimes we've seen that say gospel. I use the word good news because many people don't know what the gospel is or they don't understand what the gospel is. But I use the word good news because I can talk about the good news of Jesus, the fact he died on the cross, paid the penalty for our sin, the very fact that he loves us so much, that he loved God, loved the world so much that he gave his son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That's the good news we're talking about, the good news of Jesus who died on the cross, rose from the dead in order to heal our brokenness. And so what happens is the little line that goes between them simply says, what must I do to have that healing? Well, the Bible would teach us that we need to repent and believe. That's it. The Bible says if we repent 
and believe we shall be saved. And so it's as easy as being able to walk them through that, help a person to know that out of that good news of the gospel then comes the very understanding that when we have that good news, when we repent and believe, what happens is the fact that we pursue God and we have restoration. God restores us and we have restoration until this relationship. Because, see, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about a relationship that we have with Jesus. What about your relationship? How does that work? How do you share your testimony inside this? You see, it really is the three circles that lead us to understand God's design. And when we understand God's design, that we, it causes sin, there's brokenness. But the good news changes everything. And it brings us back to being restored in our relationship with Jesus, the Father. What about you? You've seen that, you know that. Maybe you've read that. Maybe you've watched it on video Maybe you're here today and you've never actually yourself walked through that to say, hey, I, I need to be restored. I need to pursue God. I need that relationship with him. Maybe you're here this morning and that's the first place that you have to begin before you can even share with someone else. Would you bow your head with me right now and let's pray together? Eternal God and Heavenly Father, as we come to you right now, we thank you so much for the good news of Jesus. Lord, we want to share out of our lives with those around us who really do need hope because there's so many who do. There's so many people around us who are hurting and who are broken and who need healing. And Lord, we know that you're the one. You're the one that brings healing. And all you do is use us as instruments to be able to share the good news. And Lord, I pray for a person in this room today. Maybe there's someone here who has broken themselves, who have never repented, who have never believed in you. Lord, I pray today that your Holy Spirit would just draw them to yourself, that they might be restored to you in that relationship with the Father even today. We thank you for your love to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, I wanna ask you to turn to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians is a book in the New Testament. It's a book that Paul writes, and we'll finish our focus by thinking about sharing our lives with people. That's really what it's about. Sharing hope is really sharing our lives with people. How do we share all the things that we have in order to be able to say, here's what God is doing? And I, I believe we wrap this up by talking as Paul helps us to understand some principles in this passage that would teach us about how we are engaged with people, how we love people, what happens as we care about those around us and as we share the gospel with people. So if you have it, we're looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. It's one of those small books back there that Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica. It's a church that he really hasn't spent a lot of time in at all. Matter of fact, in Acts chapter 17, when Paul goes to Thessalonica, to Thessalonica and the church is formed there, he has run out of town very quickly. Matter of fact, he was preaching, he was teaching in the church, he was trying to gather people around him, but there was an uprising because the culture in Thessalonica, the, the trade center of where it was, man, it was an important city, and Paul spoke right into the middle of it, and he was talking about the gospel, and people got upset, and they ran him out of town. And so he didn't get to spend much time there. And then they began to complain about him and to talk about him. They began not to like him. Those who were not of Paul really did um, make a great fuss about who he was. And then in this, this whole verse, chapter 1 and 2, he's been defending who he is. But I think inside chapter 2, these first eight verses that we'll deal with this morning... He gives us some really good principles on how we deal with those around us. So if you have that, I want to read that and, and you can follow along. In chapter 2, verse 1, he says, For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our pill does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never come with words of flattery, as you know, nor with pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you 
or from others. Though we could have made demands as apostles for Christ, but we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So, being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you have become very dear to us. Well, I think in this passage, we find some really good principles about what it means for us to be people sharing hope with those around us. That's really what we've been talking about, and it doesn't end today. Our opportunity to be among people is always here. Paul deals with that in these eight verses. Let's look, for example, at verse one and two to start with. The first thing we want to see is boldness to declare the gospel in culture conflict. There's a lot of conflict going on around us. It didn't take us long to figure that out. It didn't take us long to read about it. It didn't take us long to listen to whatever we were listening to. But there's a lot of cultural conflict. Paul says, remember when I was in Philippi. Philippi is that story back in Acts chapter 16 where Paul went to Philippi and he was preaching and he changes things around because there was a girl who was demon-possessed, and he, uh, he, he moved that and changed that where she was no longer demon-possessed, and those people who were her guardians who made money off of her got so upset with Paul that they brought him and threw him in prison. You might remember that story. Paul's in Philip. He's in, he's in jail in Philippi, and the earthquake comes, right, and the doors open, and the jailer is there. The jailer gets saved. Uh, But there's so much anger, so much struggle that Paul has to leave that place, leaving behind some of those. He'd gone through so much trial in Philippi, they were very angry with him. Why? Because in the middle of the culture, in the middle of so many things that were going on, Paul got in the middle of the culture with the boldness, and he tells us that in the passage, right, with the boldness of the good news of Jesus. He didn't get caught up in culture wars. He didn't get caught up in great sayings. He didn't get caught up in trying to defend what was going on in culture or even oppose what was going on in culture. His focus was very clear. His focus was this is the gospel. This is the good news of Jesus. This is what's going to make the change in life because people are looking for that. They're looking for hope. They're looking for something that's going to give them some hope. And Paul says, as he says at the end of verse 2, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel, the good news of God, in the middle of the conflict, much conflict that's going on. Right in the middle of that was the boldness that he had to have. Now, I think the principle is also for us that we have to have the kind of courage, the kind of courage to step in to culture. Not that we have to have a knowledge of culture or be an expert on culture or know what's going on in culture, but the, the courage to step into culture with the good news of Jesus. That's the clear focus of the church. That's the clear focus of believers. We can speak to things that are going on in culture only as it comes out of the gospel, only as the good news is having impact to that, only as it's making a difference. But he says that with that boldness, and the word that he's using is is the courage that he has. The other word that comes out of that, that word boldness is the word confidence, that you're gonna have confidence to step into that, not not shying away from it, not being afraid of it, not being able to say, man, I don't wanna get entangled with all the things that's going on because you don't wanna get entangled with the things that are going on. What you want to get entangled is with the good news of Jesus, that he is the one. So it's it's a clear focus that Paul has given to the church. It's a clear focus that Paul is saying to us as believers that who we're about is to have the courage and the confidence to step into the conflicts around us, not with some great words, he's gonna get to that in a moment, but with the good news of Jesus, talking about the fact that in the brokenness, we can find repentance, we can find forgiveness, we can find healing from our brokenness through Christ and through Christ alone. We believe that as a church. That's who we are. That's who we are as followers of Christ. He goes on, however, and he doesn't stop at verse two, but he goes on to verse three. So it's not only a boldness to declare the gospel, it is a belief in the power of God and power of the gospel in your community of influence. Now, I put your community of influence because 
You're responsible for your community of influence. I don't know your community of influence. I don't know your family. I can't speak into them, but you can. And look what Paul says in verse 3. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. Three words, we'll come back to those. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. So here, the principle of this is that we're inside our area of influence, the people that we know, our community, and he says inside that, those three words, we do not do that from error, which really means the opposite of that is truth. So we are bringing truth to the situation. We're bringing truth inside our relationships. Jesus said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. So Paul says that this appeal of the gospel is coming not from error, but from truth. We have confidence in the truth of God. He also says not from just confidence or in truth or error or impurities. The word he uses for impurities here is our moral lives, how we live out our lives. And then the third word that he uses is the idea or any attempt to deceive or fraud. You see, what Paul has said about our influence is community here. It's really how are you living inside the community in which you live, the people who know you your family, your associates, your work associates, people who know who you are. Paul is saying that when I step into the community of influence in Thessalonica, I did so with no error. There's always truth. I did so with no impurities. We were morally right. We were doing things correct, and I was doing it not to deceive you. I wasn't, I was who I was. I wasn't deceiving you in any way. So the principle is how we live out our lives in the community in which God has placed us, how we live our life in our workplace, in our neighborhoods, in the school that we attend, and people that we hang out with. What does our life look like? How do we live that out where we are? Paul says it needs to be lived out with truth, with a moral life that's real, and an understanding that we're not deceiving people. That what we are is real. Who we are in Christ is real. What comes out of that is so important to that because we are inside that community. Now, he goes on in the next verses to say that inside that community, we're building on our witness in order to make an impact. We're not just hanging out. We're not just being around people, but there's a purpose, and that purpose is the impact for the gospel. Look, if you will, to verse 5. He says, for we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with pretext for greed, God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others. You see, Paul was saying that the impact that you have in people's lives are lived out in what you do and how you live. Now, back up to the very end of verse 4. He says at the very end of verse 4 that God who tests our hearts. Now, that's a very interesting little word. It says that in the ESV. That's the translation that I'm using this morning. God who tests our hearts. If we're going to make impact into the community in which God has placed us, are we going to allow God to test our hearts? The word that Paul uses here is very personal. He says that I was tested not in cultural conflict, not in persecution, not in things that were going on, but his heart was tested as if by fire. So God knows, knows his heart. He's talking about the motives that he has. So he brings his personal motives of life into how he's making impact into the community. You see, when we begin to think about share hope and you begin to think about the people that you are around and that you live with, work with, hang around a lot, how does your life impact them out of the motives of your life? Paul is getting to the depth of that. He is saying that God is the one that's testing your heart. Hmm, that can be troublesome, right? What does God find when he tests your heart? What does God see when he tests your heart? What does God discover when he tests your heart? Does he discover in you that you are pursuing him? Does he discover in you that you are spending time with him? 
Is he discovering in you your desire to be like him so that your life is being shaped and molded into who he is? Does he find in you that mind of Christ that Paul talks about in the Philippians that we can take on the mind of Christ? And so when Paul talks about that our hearts are being tested, man, it's, it's a deep word because it's a deep word that leads into these verses that we read just a moment ago because they, he never comes with words of flattery or any pretext of greed. That means that what he is saying, as I, I go back earlier, it's not, it's not how good you can draw, it's not the words that you use, it's the fact that you are simply sharing the good news and you're living it out. Our hearts have been tested. We're living out the spirit of God that's in us. And then the last two verses of the day in verse seven and eight, if we're building on our witness to make an impact, Paul says it's because of the relationship that we have. Look at verse seven. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own child. What a great image that is, right? We get that image. We understand what that image is like. We get that Paul is saying, man, there is a relationship here, a deep relationship. And he had been around him, and he had been praying for him and caring for him. And the question becomes to us, what kind of relationship do we have with those around us? Go on and read this. As he says, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves because you had become very dear to us. So if we're impacting our community, it is because we're in relationship and the people around us is becoming dear to us. Isn't that a great word? We, we love them. You know, sometimes we feel like we need to share the gospel with someone so they can have eternal life, and we do. And sometimes we feel like we need to share the gospel with someone because we're supposed to, you know? The Bible says you've got to share Jesus. Well, it does. Sometimes we share the gospel because it's like, man, the pastor's been talking about it, and we've got to do that, you know? And, well, that's helpful sometimes. But really, the vital point of what Paul, I believe, is saying in verse 8 is we share the gospel with people because we love them, because we care for them because we have such affection for them. And it's shown in what we say to them. It's shown in how we respond to them. It, it's shown in how we act toward them, but it's also shown in just how we act. And Paul says, I, I have this affection, and, and I'm, I'm really, my affection for you is growing, and as my affection for you is growing, I'm sharing with you the gospel, but I'm sharing with you great love, and I'm sharing with you things that you need in your life. I'm sharing with you things that's going to help you to get through life. I'm sharing not just the gospel, he would say, not just the gospel, but he's sharing the gospel because the gospel is the greatest thing. That's the gospel is good news. But Paul says, I'm sharing myself. Everything I am in Christ, I'm sharing with you. I may get it wrong. I, I'm, I'm trying to be truthful. I'm trying to have moral up, up, uprightness. I'm trying to be the kind of person that's not in any way being a fraud. But I'm sharing these things not with great words or great flattery of words. I'm sharing all that I'm sharing about the good news of Jesus because I love you so much. And as a church and as a people, if we can look around our community and begin to see people and love them, as we get to look around the nations of the world and begin to see people who are hurting, people that we can love them, what would that lead us to do? It would lead us to share the gospel. It would lead us to say, we have the greatest news for you and the news that brings hope into your life. Why? Because we love you so much. We care for you because you are dear that person that you've written on that name on that white ping pong ball, are they dear to you? Do you love them so much that you can't help but not share the gospel? Because it's so important. And Paul says that. He says, as he finishes verse 8, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also ourselves, because you have become very dear. Would you bow your head with me right now? And together, let's just think about that person or those people or those families. And maybe the Lord brings to your mind and heart 
How do you love them? How do you love them so much that you can't help but share Jesus with them? How do you love them so much that it's not just about Jesus, but it's about our whole life? Saying we love people. And maybe you're here this morning and you've never trusted Christ. You've never repented and believed. We want to give you that opportunity to do that. Maybe you're here this morning and God has laid that person on your life that you need to really love in a greater way. We'd love for you to pray about that. You might want to come forward, pray with one of our prayer counselors. It's up to you. Really, in these next few moments, the greatest thing is what the Spirit of God might be leading you to do. You're not responding to me. You're not responding to the music. You're responding to the Spirit. How's the Spirit leading you today to respond to him? Father, we thank you for your love to us. Guide us. Help us. Help us to trust you more. Help us to love other people the way you do. In Christ's name, amen. Would you stand as we sing?